Hello, YouTube. Hello, everyone out in the live stream and those of you who watch later. Hey, Brian. Hey, Ann. Hey. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Let's start the podcast. Hello, and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 274, recorded March 8th, 2022. I'm Michael Kennedy. And I'm Brian Aachen. And I'm Ann Barella. Welcome, man. It is so great to have you here. It's it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about Python things with you and devices and maybe even space. Who knows? Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get into our topics, just tell people a quick bit about yourself. You, you've had a varied background and you've done a lot of interesting things. Sure. Um, I may be known in the Python community as the author of the book, Make Getting Started with Adafruit Circuit Playground Express, which goes over CircuitPython. And I've done numerous tutorials and blog posts for Adafruit Industries, um, where I've been working for the past four years. Uh, prior to that, I had a 30-year career with the US Department of State as a diplomat uh, and security engineer, um, reaching the level of the senior foreign service. Wow. Wow, neat. Awesome. I bet you have some stories to tell that you can't tell. I have some I can and some I can't. So. <laughs> indeed, indeed. All right, well, welcome to the show. It's nice to have you here. Thank you. So, Brian, there's that old famous saying, programming is like riding a bike. Is that how it goes? What is that? I've never heard that. Oh, yeah. No, I neither have I. <laughs> but well, tell us about your bike. Uh, OK, so I'm not sure what the bike is for, but um, um, actually, it's a cool looking bike. It but is. anyway, uh, what we're talking about is uh, Adam Johnson's article, uh, The Well-Maintained Test, 12 Questions for New Dependencies. And he's calling it the well-maintained test, but I'm going to call it the Adam test. I think I think the Adam test is better. Um, and. <laughs> Anyway, he's referencing, uh, do you remember Joel Spolsky's The Joel Test? I remember remember Joel Spolsky. Uh, okay. I, don't, I don't remember the test, though. Okay, so he, ha he has this test, um, and it's referenced in this blog post, but I'm not going to click over to it. But there's a link in here. But it's essentially like uh, trying to, it's a 12-question question and answer thing of like yes and no questions about whether or not you, sh whether or not your software team is healthy. Um, it's it, it's interesting, a little bit dated, um, but it's it's an interesting read. Um, but it, that's way back from like the year 2000, so before a lot of you were born. Um, <laughs> but now we've got uh, the Atom test, and it's about whether or not you should pick up a dependency on your project. Um, so in in the again, there are yes no questions, and there's 12 questions, and it's a uh, it's kind of I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, it's just questions about a project. So let's just run through them. Uh, is, is it described as production ready? And is, it, is there sufficient documentation? Is there a change log? Is someone responding to bug reports? Are there sufficient tests? That's a, that's a tough one actually to answer if you're from the outside. But are the tests running on the latest Python version? Or are the tests running on the latest integration version? So he says language and integration. So, for instance, um, is it running on the latest? Is it running Python 3.10 in, in CI? And is it running the late, latest Django version if it's a Django utility or PyTest version if it's a PyTest plugin or something? Is there a CI configuration? Is you know, is it running on CI? Is it pat? Is the CI passing? Does it seem relatively well used? And there's there's ways to look for that um, uh, with PyPI stats. And then uh, has there been a commit in the last year and has there been a release in the last year? Uh, the 12th one is interesting, I think, because sometimes there have been commits. There are maintainers that are pushing to the main line, uh, but, um, but nobody's actually releasing to PyPI because the actual one person that has uh, release privileges doesn't, hasn't been doing that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, I guess... What do you think? He goes through more detail, but do you have any comments on this, uh, either Michael or Ann? Sure, I have some oh. thoughts. Yeah, go, go ahead, Ann. Um, I, I like this list. I mean, uh, obviously, it 
it's directly related to some of the work we've been doing uh, at uh, Adafruit. I mean, and uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, we don't have bottlenecks like uh, uh, there are multiple people have uh, authorization to do releases and and uh, and merges and that type of thing. And it, it would be rather uh, unsettling if there was a package that was several years old and and no releases and that's where you start getting into problems perhaps yeah sure i i, I totally agree things can be done i mean there can be a, a like here's the thing that parses css styles like maybe that just doesn't need to be updated but that's not the case for most things here's a web framework it hasn't changed in four years mm, that might make you nervous because the web has changed a lot in four years and python's changed so is it yeah. even is it even it just takes a little bit to you have to push to to get kick the CI and test on, I guess you don't have to. You can manually kick CI to run it on the latest Python version. But um. yeah, one one more area, and that might be multiple little uh, additions, or it might be grouped into one that people understand as a, a group of things. But does it use modern language ideas and constructs? So, for example, does it use Python type hints or no? Yeah. Does if if it's something that is inherently talking to external systems or something like that, does it use async and await? Is there an async capability, right? Or if if I'm like, well, I really want to use fast API and I have this database that would be awesome to talk to, but this thing in the middle that does the database part, there's no async version. Well, then I've thrown away. I, I cannot access that part of the new Python world, right? Mm -hmm. And so those those kinds of like group that into does it use modern Python ideas and features? Yeah, that that one's a tough one because sometimes a, a project will want to support older Python versions, so they can't really. Yes, but exactly. There's that. Um, one of the things Anne said that I wanted to highlight was, I like this question, this these twelve questions to ask of my own projects. Not, I mean, yes, it's for dependencies, but I also these are good questions just to ask for your own project. They're yeah, like how how am I doing? How am I doing? Um, <laughs> and I have this pa package that's kind of. Uh, kind of used by a handful of people or maybe a thousand people but if i've not updated in the last couple of years that's kind of lame i should just take a few hours and go check it out and push something up so yeah for sure all right i now that i see your list and know what you're talking about i love it it's great i want to talk about abusing things let's talk about stack abuse <laughs> no okay. stack abuse is just the blog from stack overflow um but what I want to talk about is validating uh, email addresses. So this might sound like a solved problem, right? We've talked about regex 101 and stuff like that. And surely you can go, you can get some regular expression and apply it to an email address. Now that may or may not be good. I, I've, there are so many little weird domains these days. Like I just got a dot tech domain that is four letters on the end and if your regex is like does it go thing at sign something dot three or two things well that fails i've had that email address come up and say oh you got to enter a valid email address like this is a valid email address you crummy regex from 2000 <laughs> you know what i mean yeah so this one goes a little bit beyond that. Like it does validate that kind of stuff that you're thinking about, right? It, it does validate that like there's an at sign and there's a domain at the end and, and those kinds of things. But it also does a couple of other things that I think are worth considering. That's kind of cool. So for example, one of the things that it'll do, if I scroll down a little bit, is it will actually check that the domain is real. So if you were to say, um, my email is something at blah, 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 junk, 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 just type in junk, like, no, 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 there's no way that could be delivered. So it's going to validate, like actually do a DNS lookup on the domain name for that, right? So it'll check on the, the internet that this is a real thing. It also does some interesting things about normalization or canonicalization of the email. So for example, there's different ways to represent the same thing in Unicode and stuff like that. And you'll end up with a, here's the definitive way in which you should express this in your database so that you can check, have I seen this before or things like that. You could even get ASCII representations of it um, from what comes back. So 
pretty cool. It'll um, it'll do the check for deliverability, and then it also does that normalization plus the regex. Wow, neat, right? Yeah, all right. Yeah, I mean it's it's not gonna change the world, right? We all have to validate email addresses and and whatnot, but putting just type equals email in a an HTML form is not going to tell you that, for example, the DNS exists and things like that. So I, I think this is a, a cool sort of next level version. And it's a Python package that runs on the server. You just pip install it and then you call validate. And of course it'll, you know, it needs to do the DNS lookup and stuff like that. Cool. I like it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it's really easy to use. So I think that that's a, that's a nice feature. So let's and it's production ready and <laughs> has a fairly recent release awesome i'm glad you checked on it <laughs> and before we switch over to Anne's first topic john sheehan out in the audience says for phone numbers i had really good luck with phone numbers all one word no spaces python library oh very cool yeah that has uh you know i think phone numbers are more complicated than emails in the sense that like they're different lengths and styles and all sorts of stuff well, I've lived uh, in many places in the world, and uh, so many people do this U.S.-centric phone number uh, <laughs> check and do not uh, parse it for international numbers, and it drives people crazy. Yeah. But it does. Cool. All right. Well, tell us about your first item. Well, I was going to talk about uh, one of the main things I've been doing with Adafruit that's Python related, and that's the Python and microcontrollers newsletter. Um, we think this is the only newsletter focusing on Python on very small hardware devices. Um, and uh, I started as editor about the, the time of the pandemic when uh, uh, priorities were switched and uh, and somebody said, well, I've got to do something else. Here, it's yours. And it's like, OK. Um, so uh, we currently have about 9,400 subscribers. Uh, and it focuses mainly on the two flavors of Python that run on small devices on hardware. And that's CircuitPython and MicroPython. Um, it, it, when, when I say it, it's kind of obvious that the full C Python will not fit on a device with limited memory and and uh, capabilities. So uh, MicroPython was first developed in CircuitPython. I'll talk about it later in the show. Um, that actually work on very small devices and uh, provide a very Pythonic experience in coding these as compared to uh, C or assembly or or some of the other uh, ways in which people do it. Yeah. Um, so um, this is obviously free and open source, just like everything else uh, Adafruit does, and hopefully much of the Python world. Um, yeah, one of the real exciting things I've seen going on with you all is um, working to get CircuitPython and MicroPython more close together. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of one world uh, for uh, small Python things. Sure, it's, I mean, CircuitPython is a fork, but we uh, we bring in the upstream uh, features of MicroPython and we provide uh, some compatibility um, through a, um, a library called Blinka. So on certain microcontrollers, you can take a MicroPython program and run it in CircuitPython. Um, but uh, there's there's some differences that were were chosen, um, and again I'll go over those in a bit. But uh, the two programs talk to each other. It's a very friendly relationship. Adafruit has provided uh, support to MicroPython. Uh, we consider it kind of a big happy family rather than uh, the Hatfields and the McCoys. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, if anybody's interested in our weekly newsletter, they can go to adafruitdaily.com. And it was specifically chosen to be a different uh, domain than Adafruit um, because there's no sharing of information between 
you know, nothing behind the curtain even. Um, it's a totally separate website. It's uh, none of the data is used for advertising and, uh, you know, all the things that one does when they sign up on, on the web. It's it's pure and, and clean and it's easy to, to uh, subscribe and unsubscribe. There's no pressure to say, oh, do you really want to unsubscribe? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I've been going through this process of unsubscribing from a, a tremendous number of old newsletters that have just piled up and so many of them are like type in your email email address here and uncheck the four things you would like to unsubscribe to i'm like you know this is not stopping me we're typing this in and this is happening i'm out of here so yeah that's good to hear yeah um, no one wants to actually go to that much effort i've made you know just one click and you know you're gone you can come back if you want to um but we really uh encourage community um involvement in this it's not and writing her own thoughts together and putting mm -hmm. them down uh, via GitHub to WordPress. It's, uh, uh, there are different ways in which people can contribute. It's all done on GitHub. So people can put an issue if they like, or actually a PR on the current document. And, uh, and I review those. Um, you accept PRs for your newsletter? Sure. That's awesome. It, why not? I mean, uh, I, I've not had uh, that many no, it's issues. Great. Somebody, we have some instructions on, okay, if you're going to put an image in, you know, make it a certain size and, and parameters. If you're going to put an animated GIF, you know, kind of do it this way. Otherwise, you know, just kind of, as long as it's kind of in the same format, I'll take it. Um, uh, again, we, we try to be very GitHub friendly. We love GitHub and, uh, yeah. um, uh, again, all the, all our stuff's open source on GitHub. So, you know, people can do whatever they wish and we want people to and encourage, uh, communication, but you know, if people don't want to, uh, uh, use GitHub, they can, uh, email the information to cpnews at adafruit.com, or they can hashtag CircuitPython or MicroPython on say Twitter. And uh, mm -hmm. I do, I go through and, and pick up things for the week there too. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, I subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. I, I love the idea of a, a sort of direct community involvement. Brian, we should have just put our show notes up beforehand and let people do PRs against it. I love it. <laughs> we just have like a Trello board. Well, I didn't put mm. it up here, but the, one of the things we do when we we tout circuit python um the phrase is code plus community and we have a pretty broad community on um again like twitter um a large discord server um reddit um, um instagram just wherever you might try to to get information uh we try to to target um copying it on there and uh yeah. and yeah, i think i think uh, um adafruit and circuit python are doing community correctly or at least doing it a good way because it's it's obvious and like for discord we have a, a code of conduct that's you know plain to see uh for circuit python it's very similar to the the discord one it's it's kind of the the philosophy of you know do good things, you know, be good. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, everybody will get along. Um, we welcome uh, uh, good hearted things to happen. And it for, you know, 99.9% .9 of it, it works. Um, because the circuit Python is not Adafruit. We want circuit Python to be much, much, much bigger than Adafruit, as far as adoption and, and effort. And again, that that reflects over to MicroPython, and the whole thing goes to uh, the bigger Python community. I mean, uh, uh, Guido Van Rossum has, has tweeted and various things saying, yes, he supports Python on small devices. I mean, small devices to supercomputers. I mean, it, it all works. Yeah, that's awesome. yeah. Very cool. All right, well, people should check it out for sure. Now, before we move on, I do want to talk about uh, our sponsor for this week, 
Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub. They're doing super cool stuff as someone who has started his own small business. It is a lot of work and there's a lot of uncertainty and knowing how to get help and having support of people who have experience is really, really valuable. So starting business is hard. They say that by some estimates, 90% of all the startups will go out of business in the first year, which is tough, but that's how it is. With that in mind, Microsoft's for startup set out to understand what startups need to be successful and create a digital platform to help overcome those challenges. And that's where they got their founders hub. So Microsoft for startups founders hubs provides all founders at any stage with free resources to help them solve startup challenges. So you get technology benefits, access to expert guidance and skilled resources, mentorship, networking connections, and so much more. So, and unlike a lot of other similar programs in the industry, it doesn't require startups to be investor backed or third party validated to participate. Founders Hub is just open to everyone. So what do you get? You get, uh, you can speed up your development with free access to GitHub and Microsoft Cloud resources that have a bunch of credits that unlock over time so you can grow without worrying about paying for stuff. And they also help startups innovate. They're partnering with companies like OpenAI, um, an AI research and deployment company to get extra benefits through their partners as well. Um, it's, so with the Founders Hub, it's not really about who you know. You have this access to this mentorship network. So you get access to a pool of hundreds of mentors across a range of disciplines in areas like idea validation, fundraising, management and coaching, sales and marketing and specific technical stress points. I think that might be the most valuable, honestly, is, hey, I need to talk to this person or somebody, is this a good idea? Is this how I should be doing and so on. So you can book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with mentors, many of whom are founders themselves. So make your idea a reality today with critical support that you'll get from Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub. Join the program, visit pythonbytes.fm slash founders hub to click the link in your show notes. And yeah, thanks Microsoft for supporting the show. Nice. Indeed. Right. All right, Brian, you got the next one, right? Yeah. So oh, <laughs> I want to talk about Git a little bit. And so um, I've been using, I mean, I've been using Git personally for a long time and for professionally for many years at work for version control, of course, but I've used others as well. And, um, and there's, it's one of the interesting things about Git is you can do it. You can use it a lot of different ways and uh, trips people up actually to start with. And I, so this was interesting. There's an article called uh, Get Organized, a, a Better Git Workflow. I actually learned about it uh, by listening to uh, episode 480 of the change log, which was uh, talking about this, this, this workflow. And the, the idea, it really appeals to me. So I'm, I'm going to, I haven't tried it, but I'm going to try it out. So I'm going to kind of go through the idea. The idea is um, when I'm, when you're working on, a new project instead or new, some new code you branch your branch your create a branch off of the the master or main or whatever and and then you just uh just push up your work with simple like you know comments for yourself or just you know work in progress uh comments is all and then uh and then when you're ready that that all of that when you're ready to to do a pr or something all of those commits are going to be in a sloppy format. It's hard to, to review those, but you, um, so what, what the proposal for this, and this is, um, Oh, who's, who's the author of this? Annie Sexton. Annie's workflow is once, once you're at that point, and you're ready to do a PR, go ahead and do a get reset of against origin main. And what that does is it keeps all of your changes that you've done, but it kind of forgets all the history. Um, and then, and then you can recommit in a logical order that makes sense for reviewing. So you can you can do, uh, you know, I, I did clean up here. I did, I added this feature over here. I fixed this bug over here. And it, and there's a comment in the, uh, the article, which I totally agree with, is you can say, I'm going to separate those into different PRs, but often that's disruptive to your workflow often there's there's a few things you're doing yeah you're cleaning up while you're coding you know brian when i do that i'm like oh i'm gonna check this in separately so i know that this is a special task that i'm gonna like isolate and then i'm like oh no i just checked in part of it you know what yep. I mean? like it's it's yeah. so easy to go oh darn i was doing these two things at the same time and yeah so you, yeah i i feel that 
So some of the benefits of this are that it's it helps uh, for uh, big PRs. So once you're once you're done, you've got a pull request that that if somebody looks at the individual commits in the PR, they're broken up into easy to review bits, um, and I think that's lovely. I um, and I you know I definitely wouldn't do something like this for you know, a one line change or a, a small change, that's kind of overkill. But uh, for things that you're working on for a while, um, this is sort of a, a cool workflow to, to play with. And I think I'm going to try it out. Looks neat. Yeah, this looks great. I'm definitely going to explore it as well because I was just listening to a podcast where somebody was talking about like, oh yeah, I, I issued a PR to myself and then I accepted it. And, and the other people laugh. They're like, that's so weird. Why would you do a PR to yourself? But like these, these organizing ways of like, this is the whole feature or this is the whole thing that I did. Like there's real value in having that as a, oh no, what changed across this? I need to go back and compare or, or like know the totality of it and stuff. I, I really like these organizing ideas. So I'm definitely going to look into it. What do you think, Ann? I like it too. Um, my, my workflow flow and uh, that of a, uh, couple colleagues I uh, I can think of uh, would would benefit from that because <laughs> some things get chaotic oftentimes with data fruit um, you're working on something you kind of get blocked and then you go to something else um, it's very easy to say okay where am I and and where did I leave off I think uh, uh, anything to help that would be wonderful yeah very cool I, I definitely use the feature branch do a bunch of changes over there, PR these days, even if it's just I'm the only one who's going to see it because it's it just helps me organize for sure. All right. Speaking of Git and organizing on all that thing, all those things, uh, traditionally, if you want to issue a bug or track uh, changes to uh, C Python, you'd have to go over to bugs.python.org, I think it was. And yet a long time ago, they moved the cpython source code to github so it would be natural like well if you're already there and you want to do a pr against github wouldn't it be awesome if like the issue was there so you could say at issue 1 million whatever it is this solves that or this addresses that or something like that and so that's starting to happen and i believe that this is really one of the things that's being made possible by lucas Lenga becoming the uh, C Python core developer in residence because he can take the time and actually focus on getting this done. It might sound like, oh, you just copy the stuff from over in that system and then you just create them over here. But there's stuff going on that like makes this a little bit tricky. So if you look at the article I'm linking to by Lukash, GitHub issues migration is coming soon. There is a bunch of stuff going on about um, testing and how long it takes let me see if I wrote that down, like one of the, the, the actual duration. So it was, it was pretty mind blowing. It was like, yeah, the migration is estimated to take anywhere from three to seven days of continuous tight loop, import this over to there next, <laughs> next, next. And so some of the things they got to deal with is like, well, if it's a seven day gap and the, the issue appears over there, but we haven't yet closed it out on the other side, well, like people could be commenting on both ones and you could get like effectively merge conflicts, I guess you would think of them as in GitHub. So hmm. pretty wild to think about how, how they're doing this. Should they start with the newest one so people have immediate access to that? Or should they start with the oldest ones because they're least likely to change? And it's, it's pretty interesting. They, they've compared it to some other really, really large platforms that have made a similar change. Like the LLVM project made a similar migration from Bugzilla Gasp, <laughs> and it took them 21 days to do to like do the import. Hmm. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on to get the C Python issues and conversation fully over to GitHub. But uh, thank you, Lukash and team, for doing this because yeah, there's a lot. And if you look at the comments below, there's a ton of comments that have like some pretty interesting stuff. If you want to uh, look deeper. And to be fair, the, some of the complexity here is because they're trying to do it without shutting people out. Because one of the things mm. you could do is you could just turn off, tr you could turn off submissions or comments for a week and then just convert it all. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. But, but then that, you know, that stops com conversation for a week. So anyway. I think the real challenge is it's difficult to turn off 
partial. It's hard to go like this older quarter of issues. We're going to turn them off and then import them. You know, yeah, but you uh, can you, like you, turn you, everything off. Yeah, you yeah. Just that's say, the problem. I think they don't want to turn it all yeah. off, right? They, yeah. If they could do it in a more fine grained way, I think that they would already be on it. But yeah, that, there's a, a lot of conversation. That's a good point, though. They you kind know, of excited held to see, off. Yeah, are you excited to see GitHub issues uh, for CPython over here where they belong next to the code? I am. Um, I've, I already read this and put it on the newsletter. Um, it's all good to have it in one place. You know, I don't know if there's any nexus between Guido working for Microsoft who owns GitHub, but the, it's definite that, you know, if the, where the code is and you have your, uh, your discussion uh, process uh, integrated and, and that actually gives um the github developers uh, a way in which to look at which a large project uh the the workflow goes as far as things and they can um make more modern uh optimizations to say hey you know we this is kind of hard it was maybe hard in bugs.python.org um we can make it a lot easier on on github with uh, maybe not today, but in, with a couple tweaks in, a, in the next release. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely going to do a stress test sort of thing <laughs> for them. Mm -hmm. All right. And you got the final one, the final one of our main topics. Sure. Um, I was going to talk a little bit. Um, I hinted at it about MicroPython, CircuitPython, and how and GitHub, as we were just talking about, is a, is a part and parcel in all of this. Um, that uh, CPython just will not work currently. I mean, somebody might someday say, okay, we'll, we'll slim down CPython. But for, for now, uh, MicroPython, which was uh, uh, started as a Kickstarter by Damian George back in 2013, does a very good job of providing Python on small microcontroller boards like a Raspberry um, a Raspberry Pi single board computer or a microcontroller board. Um, and microcontrollers are all around us. Um, you know, there's one in this microphone and they're, they're, yeah. they're everywhere. They're sprinkled like silicon dust. Um, MicroPython um, has some syntax that isn't quite the same as CPython in certain areas. Um, Adafruit, when looking at moving um, into an easy way to program microcontrollers, decided that MicroPython was a wonderful starting point, but they, they forked it to um, have some features which they wanted to focus on, um, uh, which is perfectly fine because um, both are under MIT open source licenses, so there's no conflict uh, as opposed to some other uh, sharing licenses. Um, why the fork? Well, um, three things. Um, CircuitPython boards are specifically made such that they have a USB port and they work just like a thumb drive. You, you plug it into you know, a computer, PC, Mac, Linux, whatever, and it should show up as a thumb drive a very small one, you know, uh, but uh, you can uh, drag a, a text file with your source code onto it or off of it, and it just runs. It immediately, once there's a change in the file system, uh, it, it picks yeah, it up. The programming model is super interesting, right? Like if there's a file called a certain thing in a certain location, it just boots and runs it top to bottom. And if that file changes, it just reboots, right? I mean, that's the equivalent right. of reboot for a, a $5 microcontroller. Mm -hmm. but we, we recommend code.py. Um, and uh, yeah, if it detects a change, then it just says, OK, I'm going to restart and do things over. And, uh, and it provides instant feedback, which a lot of people like uh, the, the tried and true uh, code uh, in a framework compile uh, fix it, uh, errors and then upload it to some piece of hardware is not 
something that a lot of uh, people understand in, in 2022, whereas anybody can copy a file from one place to another. And uh, then they light up when they say, hey, it worked, or, or, oh, I got an error message. I need to, you have a little syntax. I'm learning Python or something. Um, yeah. So Brandon out in the audience, former guest here, said, I flashed my ESP32S to run MicroPython and haven't looked back. Right the, uh, especially on ESP32 processors, there's a framework by the, uh, the company that makes it, and it's rather daunting um, what you might have to do. Um, CircuitPython or MicroPython makes it very easy to think of it just as another piece of hardware rather than a specialized uh, uh, way in which one might have to code it previously. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, oh, um, CircuitPython specifically wants to use CPython syntax whenever possible, um, because again, MicroPython has, has deviated a bit, but we, we want as much CPython code to be mirrored over as, as possible. Um, and finally, yeah, make it easy to use and understand for beginners. Yet, you know, all, pretty much most of the hooks are there, so power users can can dig right in. Uh, uh, we recently added a sync IO. Um, oh, nice. We're talking about it, yeah. Um, MicroPython actually does uh, asynchronous work a little better than CircuitPython. It exposes some of the lower levels, and and again, we we recommend. The power users use that, but uh, um, CircuitPython wants to um, come into that world also. So, um, nice. yeah, um, it also provides a lot of equipment uh, abstraction. That um, there are currently 283 boards that that are compatible with CircuitPython. And 87 single board computers. Now, Raspberry Pi lineup, everybody knows about, but what about Orange Pi and Banana Pi, the Sony Spresents? Uh, uh, there are... Pi board and all those things, yeah. Yeah. Um, that They run C Python just fine, but if you want to hook up a specific sensor, you don't want to have to code down to the uh, register uh, level on, on shifting bits around. Adafruit's already done that for a lot of hardware. So you throw on the, uh, some software called the Blinka abstraction layer, and that interfaces between CPython on the small boards and CircuitPython code in the library. And for the most part, it just works. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Circuit, Circuit Python is great. People who want to get started with small devices should definitely, definitely check that out. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of... Uh, uh, tutorials on the Adafruit learning system and, and various websites around the internet of people who have tackled some of these uh, interface changes. And uh, we encourage people to uh, check things out, kick the tires. Cool. Oh, very nice. All right. Well, that's it for our main items, Brian. Oh, I just wanted a, a quick got 30 out. minutes for this next one. What's the 30, 30 minutes. <laughs> no, I just thought that this is a really easy, um, quick blog post by Daniel Roy Greenfield that I wanted to plug because it's a good idea. 30 minute rule. So if you're working on a problem at work or and especially at work, if you have colleagues and you get stuck on the same problem for this for the half an hour, half an hour is the mark. You should ask for help uh, because maybe you're just spinning your wheels or wasting time. I would also add in, maybe that's time to just get up and go get some coffee, yes, go have some absolutely. lunch, uh, walk around and, and it, maybe you don't have the problem, but, um, but yeah, it's a different number for different people, but just remember, don't get stuck for too long. It's probably not you. It's, you're just thinking about it wrong or something. Yeah. So. There's, there's Twitter, there's uh, discords, there's places you can go and ask for help and yeah. yeah. Or even co coworkers. So I got two quick extras. One, James wrote into us. Remember I said, when you say Python 3, do you really need to go back and say, well, Python 3, 7, 2 and beyond is this thing I am talking? Or just like, if it's an expired version of Python, do we really, you know, a non-supported out-of-date, like Python 3, 2 or something, do you really need to explicitly not talk about it? 
Well, James wrote in, said, uh, you guys were discussing the Python 3 to mean uh, any current supported version rather than say 3.7 plus or similar. In my world, that's a really bad idea. There's still tons of people using unsupported versions of Python and they're not all val invalid use cases. For example, I'm one of the upstream maintainers at Cloud Init. And I was only recently able to remove Python 3.5 in order to make 3.6 our minimum supported version, which will continue for a year. The reason is that our main customers are downstream distro packages like Ubuntu and Red Hat and so on. And it's not uncommon for software uh, released into long-term support, LTS OSs, to be supported for five to 10 years. So yeah. that's, uh, that's a world that I don't live in, but I didn't really think about the LTS story of like, yeah, we're gonna support this for 10 years and it comes with this. So it's gotta keep getting that. So yeah, that's a very valid point, James. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for sharing your experience. Top of the list of jobs I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> Is it 10 years old and I can't change it? Uh, okay. <laughs> And then uh, I was going to talk about Paul Cutler's new podcast, The Circuit Python Show. Um, if you're into Circuit Python, check it out. He's he's really into Circuit Python, and uh, he and I have talked a lot about getting him set up on this podcast. So, congrats! Happy to see that out there. And I hear you're going to be on the show. Is that right? Um, yes. Uh, in a in an upcoming episode, I will be on it. Um, you know, Paul is not affiliated with Adafruit, no paid, no, he has independent control. It's his baby. But uh, we love the fact that he's doing it. Uh, we've recommended people in the community that uh, he might want to chat with. And, and again, he's he's interviewing, you know, the odd Adafruit person, but, uh, and I mean odd, but um, <laughs> that, that there are many other people uh, and, you uh, um, I like what he's doing a lot. Uh, yeah. I listened to the first episode. He's also got like a preview thing of like, what is this thing I'm doing? And um, yeah, it's it's good so far. So today of... it, it's less pounder. He works. Um, he's done a lot in the UK. Um, he's working for Tom's Hardware, and oh, nice. he's done a lot with uh, Circuit Python. So it's wonderful. Speaking of podcasts, I just want to give a quick uh, announcement, Brian, that we traditionally have not been on Spotify. I now moved our stuff over to Spotify. So if people yeah. want to listen on Spotify for Python Bytes, it is now there. Join the dark side. We have joined the dark side. All right. Uh, that's it for all of our stuff, right? Are we ready for a joke? Yeah. It's sure. You know, it's we're recording a Tuesday, March 8th. Imagine that it is Friday and... Come into work. I, has this ever happened to you? Me on Friday. I'll just stop here and pick up where I left off. Me on Monday. This is developer just <laughs> staring, like holding their head, like, what? What yeah. was I doing? Why did I not make a better note of this? Why did I not write this down? What is happening? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's <laughs> we good. Can all, we can all relate, right? Right, Ann? Oh, definitely. Been there. <laughs> so you got to give good whip comments to yourself. Uh... Uh, when you commit on last on Friday, but, yeah. But absolutely. Friday, you're trying to get out. You know, you're trying to uh, you know start your weekend. I mean, <laughs> notes. I mean, exactly, exactly. This this is the hangover, though. This is what you get. I oh, love it. <laughs> I do too. All right. Well, I love that Anne came to join, and I love being here with you, Brian, every week. So thank you both. Yeah, and thanks everybody that that was on the uh, on the stream watching. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It, it's been a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, same. Bye.